After grave calamity, the world slumbers. The old world's most powerful empires have fallen, or are, perhaps unluckily, in the process of a long and arduous death. The Far East sees China fragmented, and India's Gupta Empire, a golden age, has come to an untimely end. The Persian Empire, the dominant force in the Middle East and Central Asia for centuries, is about to change forever. In Europe, barbarian tribes inherited the earth from the fallen Roman Empire. Rome's successor to the East was strong, but internal conflicts and attacks from all sides saw the Byzantine Empire fail to make it out of the post-classical era. Ancient Sub-Saharan Africa saw the Bantu migration change the demographics of the continent. Urban settlements were also built in West Africa but seemingly abandoned, and in the East, the kingdoms of Aksum and Nubia would grow to become substantial powers. North Africa was home to the Egyptians and Carthaginians. Medieval Africa would be a whole new game. North Africa changed first, as the Islamic expansion, birthed out of the Arabian Peninsula, expanded in record time. By the mid-600s, a caliphate was established over the Sahara, and Islamic influence would shift southwards. This would leave sub-Saharan Africa split between Christian, Islamic, and traditional animist belief systems. Though Christianity was on the continent centuries longer in Ethiopia, Islam became prominent in both the East and West, mainly due to trade. In West Africa, Islamic traders would have an influence on those who lived in the Sudan and Niger River Valley. The Trans-Sahara trade route was one of the most extensive in medieval times, and helped West Africa develop rich Islamic empires. The first major one was the Ghana Empire, lasting around 800 years, and saw the creation of numerous urban centers. The introduction of the camel into West Africa made trade easier and more regular. The Ghana Empire would become a vassal state, and replaced with the Mali Empire in the early 1200s. The kings of this empire were called Mansa, the most famous being Mansa Musa, who is thought to be one of the richest men to have ever lived. This was all thanks to the Trans-Saharan trade. Timbuktu was an important city in this empire. The Mali Empire would eventually fall, and the Songhai would become the hegemonic power in the region. While not originally a Muslim empire, the Songhai would blend African animist beliefs with Islam. They surpassed the Mali Empire in terms of wealth, area, and power, but would fall to gunpowder technology from Morocco in the late 1500s. In the east, the Swahili coast was a group of port cities on the eastern coast of Africa. Originally Bantu, the Swahilis, which translates to people of the coast in Arabic, would operate in the Indian Ocean trade, and would exchange various luxury items like porcelain, silk, and slaves. In Africa's south, there were traditional African societies which would also participate in this trade, such as the city of Great Zimbabwe, known for its impressive walls. Apart from the emergence of Islam, Africa would remain relatively stable and autonomous during its medieval period, as Europeans fought futile wars amongst themselves and the Middle East. The stories we hear about the European Middle Ages are often romanticized, most written much later. Tales of sword and sorcery often take place in medieval settings, even in real places, such as England, but the Middle Ages in Europe, which is usually separated into three parts, was much more mundane. The early Middle Ages occurs after the fall of Rome. In reality, the beginning of this new age saw the same trends we saw earlier. Rome hadn't been a factor for decades and we see continued deurbanization and a decline of population in general. Trade decreased, and barbarian migrations continued. Most notably the Viking expansion from the north, and the Magyars from the east. Even though this period was later termed the Dark Ages, it was not devoid of culture or advancements. Culture was quite complex as there would be a mix of barbarian, Roman, and Christian traditions. 
Eastern Europe would see the Byzantine Empire, successors to the Roman tradition, lose territory to the emerging Rashidun and new made Islamic caliphates. The Code of Justinian, written during this period, would be used later on as an inspiration for legal codes of European states. The loose confederation of the Kievan Rus would be christianized by the Eastern Orthodox Church and are regarded as the foundations of the Russian state. The Byzantine Empire would reach its peak during the Macedonian Renaissance of the 9th to 11th centuries, as they attempted to organize their knowledge, compiling books and manuals of military and governmental affairs, and encyclopedias. In the West, year 800, the Frankish King Charlemagne would found the Carolingian Empire, what was to be a Christian revival of the Roman Empire. It would soon become divided after his death, eventually developing into different states. The High Middle Ages, known as a fairly stable time in the medieval period, saw population starkly increase, and new advancements in agriculture and technology. This can be attributed to a slight warming in the North Atlantic, leading to the medieval warm period. This increased crops, leading to a boom in trade. Society at this time was structured in a feudal and manorial system. Feudalism is a complex subject on its own, but in simple terms, it's the political relationship between a king and his vassals. These vassals are generally nobles, and the king grants them land in exchange for military service offered by their knights. Manorialism deals with the relationship between the noble and those who tend to this land, called villains or serfs. They were allowed to live on the land, but had to provide labor for the knights and nobles, often in the form of producing goods from the farms. Two of the most prominent events of the High Middle Ages are the conquest of England, in which the Normans from continental Europe defeated and took over Anglo-Saxon England, and the Crusades, which saw armies of Christian soldiers march to the Middle East to liberate Jerusalem. This would lessen the idea of the nation-state for the time being, as Europeans felt connected due to religion. Literature was filled with stories of chivalry and courtly love. These are concepts we tend to associate with the Middle Ages. Scholasticism was a philosophy that would dominate the High Middle Ages, and even later until the Renaissance. It was a way to learn using the methods of the ancient classical era philosophers mixed with Christian theology. Originating from the monastic tradition, this method of learning would be more open to reason and learning. Both would eventually fall out of favor in the early modern era. Near the end of this period, architecture changed as well. Beautiful Gothic buildings would be constructed, a contrast to the classical Romanesque architecture that was prevalent in the early Middle Ages. The late Middle Ages brought an end to the prosperous High Middle Ages. Up to half the population of Europe perished in what we now call the crisis of the late Middle Ages. Following the medieval warm period, the same regions were plunged into a little ice age, leading to agricultural crisis. The Great Famine was the first of a series of plagues that ravaged most of Europe. But the small continent would come into contact with death itself in the mid-1300s. Brought in from the east, the Black Death made starvation from famines look like an easy death. Killing up to one-third of the population, the Black Death is regarded as the most fatal pandemic in human history. The rise in famines, plagues, and instability also led to numerous revolts. There were peasant revolts in both England and France, but there was still no solace. The end of this period would see England battle France for the throne of both kingdoms in the Hundred Years' War. The effects of this grim period of depopulation caused people to question the church and their faith. These were major factors that would lead into Europe's next period. The Middle East. Out of the ancient period, we see the continuation of a great rivalry. The Eastern Roman Empire, successors to Rome, and the Sasanian Empire, the latest and last iteration of the old Persian empires. 
the Byzantine-Sasanian War, fought in the early 600s, would be devastating to both empires. Little did they know, a new power would emerge. The Rolling Sands of Arabia This is the home of the Bedouins, Arab tribes who originally lived in the Arabian Peninsula. United under a single mantle by Muhammad in Medina, the nomadic Bedouins, and those who succeeded their prophet, would expand into the Middle East and North Africa, taking huge chunks of land from the Byzantine and Persian empires. The initial expansion resulted in the Rashidun Caliphate, and then the Umayyad Caliphate. The Arab-Byzantine Wars saw Islamic expansion into Eastern Roman land, but they couldn't take the capital Constantinople itself, in part due to the Roman use of Greek fire. The Muslim army would succeed in conquering Persia though, leading to the end of the centuries-old empire. With most of the region unified, the Islamic caliphates were positioned at the center of the Old World and at the crossroads of trade. Islamic traders would be able to travel to different areas, introducing others to their faith. This also was a boon economically as well. Traders and explorers would bring back knowledge and inventions to the Muslim world, and mixed with the sources from places they had conquered, like Egypt, they would experience a golden age. Arab dominance in the region lasted for almost 500 years, but in the 11th century, Turkic nomads from Central Asia, called the Seljuk Turks, would migrate south in a series of invasions. They captured Persia, the Mesopotamian region, and parts of the Levant and Saudi Arabia. Their treatment of Christian pilgrims to the region they now controlled, and of the Christian communities already living therein, led to a series of invasions from Europe to secure the Holy Land. The First Crusade saw the Europeans retake Jerusalem, and establish the Kingdom of Jerusalem in 1099. It would last for almost 100 years, when it was retaken by Saladin. In the 1200s, the Middle East would be beset by other invasions. Out of Central Asia, another even more ruthless peoples would invade the Middle East, sacking Baghdad, and reaching the Egyptian border. These Mongols retreated soon after, but the discord caused the Seljuk Turks to be deposed. The emerging Turco-Mongol peoples in the late 1300s saw Timur invade the region soon after. By the end of the period it was the Ottomans, another Turkic people, who would be in control of Western Asia. In South Asia, the medieval period is roughly defined as starting from the end of the Gupta Empire in the 500s. In the south, the Chola dynasty, ruled by Tamils, would control a thalassocracy, spanning Sri Lanka, the Maldives, and other islands. Buddhism had been important in India, but would begin to disappear after invasions from the Turkic Islamic nomads that would begin in the 1100s. They succeeded and would found the Delhi Sultanate in 1206, the beginning of centuries of Muslim rule in India. This would last until the 1500s when a stronger Islamic power would dominate the region, continuing Muslim rule. Southeast Asia would prosper during this period. Trade from South Asia and China would pass through the Strait of Malacca, a preeminent trading channel. Most of the region was under heavy influence from South Asia. Only North Vietnam had closer ties to the Chinese. In the 900s, a Chinese Tang commandery in Vietnam declared independence, later becoming Dai Viet, or Great Viet, but this region would still be heavily under Chinese influence. South Vietnam was home to the Champa Kingdom, and was governed by Hindus, associating more with their neighbors to the west. North Vietnam would eventually annex this area. Because of the trade in South Asia and East Asia, along with the spread of culture, the Southeast benefited greatly. Empires would rise, like the Khmer Empire in Cambodia. The Khmer capital, Angkor Thom, was regarded as one of the largest cities in the world at the time. The city could lay claim to over 100 hospitals. In Burma, present-day Myanmar, the empire of Pagan would emerge, using war elephants for their military might. 
Indonesia would be home to the Srivijaya, a Malay thalassocracy, which became quite a powerful empire from their control of the Sunda Strait, a crucial trading route in between the islands of Java and Sumatra, and the Strait of Malacca. It was during this period we believe Indonesian sailors traveled across the Indian Ocean, settling in Madagascar, off the coast of Africa. Changes on the continent, mainly due to the Mongol invasions, had consequences for these southeast empires. The Cambodian Khmer Empire would be replaced with the Siamese Ayut Higher Kingdom, and Indonesia's Srivijaya was taken over by the Majapahit, a Hindu empire from Java, and later on by the Malacca Sultanate. Just to the north, the Chinese would benefit from increased trade, and became the foremost power in the region, and arguably the whole continent. Japan and Korea would voluntarily adopt Chinese culture. They brought in aspects of Confucianism, Buddhism, and centralized government and bureaucracy. The short-lived, but important Sui dynasty, patched up and unified China again, and the subsequent Tang and Song dynasties took China to its greatest height seen until that time. They would become the world's top economy at that point, three times larger than all of Europe during the 1100s. The first recorded chemical formula for gunpowder was also created here, along with gunpowder weapons, like the Fire Lance. During the Tang Dynasty, China became increasingly involved in foreign affairs. They wanted to secure more of the Silk Road, so expanded westwards. Encroaching into Central Asia, they would come into conflict with the Abbasids, the third Islamic caliphate to succeed the Prophet Muhammad, who halted this expansion. Chinese prisoners from this battle are said to have brought paper-making technology to the Arab world. The Onlushan rebellion also hit the Tang hard, bringing about the death of perhaps millions. The Tang would fall in 907, leading to a civil war known as the Five Dynasties and Ten Kingdoms period. It wouldn't last long, and the Song Dynasty would form in 960, and consolidate China by 979. They differed from the Tang, in that they would particularize in maritime trade. This caused China's population to gather more southward, towards trading ports. With ships reaching Arabia, India, and the neighboring regions to the south, China's economy continued to expand. Deeply devoted to their economy, the Song began using machines to produce products, with coal as a power source. These advances in the 11th and 12th centuries are regarded as an industrial revolution. Because of their focus on the economy, their military grew weaker, leaving them open to invasions to the north, by the Jurchen, ancestors to the Manchu. By the 13th century, China was divided once again, with the north fragmented, and the Song to the south. Civil war broke out between the rival states, leaving China a prime target for the Mongols, eventually being annexed by the nomadic hordes. By 1279, the Yuan dynasty, under the Mongols, had control of China and Korea. Japan would be able to escape this fate however. With the Mongols in control, they made China more open to the West. The famous Venetian explorer, Marco Polo, would visit, detailing his travels on the Silk Road. Soon after, less than 100 years since its founding, the Yuan dynasty was deposed in a series of revolts known as the Red Turban Rebellion. In their place, the Ming dynasty took power in 1368. They would be the last ethnically Han Chinese dynasty. Early on, the Yongle Emperor constructed a naval fleet, and sent them on expeditions to the west, under the guidance of Admiral Zheng He. After this brief period though, the Ming would isolate themselves from the West for hundreds of years. Korea and Japan continued to have links with China, although not as much as earlier in the period. The Korean Emperor, Sejong the Great, created Hangul, or the Korean alphabet in 1443, replacing Chinese characters, and creating a unique and intuitive writing system. Japan had just gone through the Heian period during its classical era, where it tried to distance itself from Chinese culture. Medieval Japan took things to an all-new level. The Kamakura period followed the Heian, and saw the establishment of the first shogun, Minamoto no Yuritomo, in 1192. Japanese samurai would become common during this time of Japanese feudalism and decentralization. 
The Kamakura period would fall in 1333, as the shogunate was destroyed, and imperial rule restored under Emperor Go-Daigo. Seemingly not yet the time for an imperial restoration, this period would only last three years, before the establishment of the Muromachi, or Ashikaga shogunate. The Muromachi period was first marked by division by those who still supported the emperor. This led to the Warring States period, also called Sengoku, a near century of constant civil war and social unrest. In 1573, the Muromachi shogunate would end, when Ashikaga Yoshioki, the last shogun, was driven out of Kyoto by Oda Nobunaga, a powerful daimyo feudal lord, and head of the Oda clan. While the early post-classical period was dominated by the rapid expansion and conquests of the Arabs from the Arabian Peninsula, the latter half of the period was dominated by nomadic invasions from Central Asia. The most famous and powerful of these were the Mongols. The beginnings of the empire were humble. In the steppes of Mongolia, tribes were united to form a more powerful entity. Genghis Khan was declared ruler of this confederation in 1206, creating an empire that extended from Central Europe to the Sea of Japan, southwards into South Asia, and eastwards into the Levant and Arabia. The Mongol Empire would have control of almost 18% of the planet's total land area, only second to the infamous British Empire that would form centuries later. The Mongol hegemony in Eurasia would bring about what historians call Pax Mongolica, a period of stability where trade was regulated, along with exchanges of ideas and technology from the West and East. After Genghis Khan's death, there was some dispute over who his successor would be. Kublai Khan, one of Genghis Khan's grandchildren, would end up being next in line, although he was not recognized by the whole tribe. By Kublai's death in 1294, the empire was fragmented into four separate Khanates, the Golden Horde in the northwest, which would become Turkicized, the Shagatai Khanate in the west, which also became Turkicized, the Ilkhanate in the southwest, and the Yuan dynasty, which ruled over China, founded by Kublai Khan prior to his death. While the Mongol Empire demonstrated the interconnectedness of the Old World, by their running of the Silk Road, the trading route had always served to keep major powers within distance. This wasn't always a blessing. Just as trading goods passed along the route from city to city, so too did diseases, often deadly. It's thought the plague of Justinian entered Europe via the Silk Road. A major outbreak of the disease killed off a quarter of the Mediterranean population. A theory also states that the Mongols were behind the bubonic plague entering Europe. They would catapult diseased corpses into enemy towns in Crimea during sieges. Those who fled the town, specifically traders, would head to Constantinople or Italy, bringing the disease with them. Old world science often has a bad reputation when it comes to the post-classical period thought as being 1,000 years of dark ages between the scientific advancements of classical antiquity and the Renaissance. But most of, if not all, of these regions advanced significantly. Africa gave rise to the kingdoms of the West and Swahili coast, each benefiting from two separate trading routes. The Islamic world experienced a golden age during this time, with knowledge from the East and from Western sources in the areas they conquered. Europeans also brought back much of this knowledge during the Crusades, which gave them access to more classical sources. Europe also experienced various periods of different renaissance during the Middle Ages. The East would highly modernize under the Chinese as well, making the post-classical period one of great progress, despite the seemingly constant setbacks. The ancient period saw just the beginning of minglings between these different empires, but the post-classical period saw the beginnings of globalization, for both its enrichment and detriment. There was one part of the earth though, that remained untouched by the old world. The land is cold and barren. Vikings settled on this snowy expanse of land in the north by around 980. 
the presence of walruses made this settlement lucrative for the ivory trade. In the 1200s, other expanding peoples would come in from the west. We aren't certain how these people, who the Norwegian Vikings called Skraling, interacted with them, but by the 1400s, because of the Little Ice Age, the Vikings abandoned their settlements, heading back east. These settlements were on Greenland, and those people initially called Skralings, were the Thule people, the ancestors to the Inuit. This is Lanzo Meadows, another Viking settlement, this time in New Finland, Canada. They would call this Vinland, because of the presence of grapevines used to make wine. This colony, set up around year 1000, would only last for around 20 years, due to constant conflict with the Beothuk native tribe. With but a slight touch of fingertips, the old world and new world would remain divided, for another 500 years. But what transpired on this continent? North America. The Hopewell culture from the ancient period was slowly replaced with the Mississippian culture in the Midwest and Eastern United States, around year 800, until European contact. They used rivers as the main mode of trade, and would be known for their mound structures. Monk's Mound is the largest pyramid north of Mesoamerica. Its base is larger than the Pyramid of the Sun in Mexico, and about the same size as the Great Pyramid of Giza. It is located in Cahokia, Illinois, the most significant city for the Mississippian culture. Population boomed there after the 11th century, but the city would be mysteriously abandoned by 1350. To the west, were the Anasazi. They would construct buildings in the Chaco Canyon in New Mexico. It's thought that each house could house up to 600 residents. In Colorado, Anasazi would build dwellings into cliff sides. They are still well preserved today. Further south, Mesoamerica was still experiencing a classical age. The Teotihuacan would start out the period at its peak. With 125,000 residents, it was considered the sixth largest city in the world at that point. The Pyramid of the Sun was the third largest pyramid on Earth, and was oriented to astronomical events. Extreme weather events in 535 and 536, which caused sporadic extreme cooling, could have caused the decline of this civilization, perhaps leading to widespread rebellion. The Maya civilization, one of the most advanced in the region, occupied the Yucatan and Guatemala in various city-states. Originally influenced by the Teotihuacan of Mexico, they would build their own complex network of trade systems. Two city-states, Tikal and Calakmul, would have a rivalry spanning centuries. Chichen Itza was one of the most significant cities, often the economic center. Mayans were complex in other areas as well. Having developed a writing system independently, along with the concept of zero, second only to the Mesopotamians, the Mayans might have also created the 365-day calendar before any of Afro-Eurasia. During the 9th century, many of these city-states were abandoned, most likely due to drought, marking the end of Mesoamerica's classical age. Their post-classical period, from the year 900, saw the Mayans still in existence, but not the power they had once been. Not much is known about the Toltecs, but they supposedly formed an empire in Mesoamerica, based on wise and kind-hearted rulers. Civil war was said to have broken out in 947, after the death of a controversial priest king, who suggested an end to human sacrifice. Centuries later, in the 1300s, bands of religious radicals would raid areas of Lower Mexico. Claiming to be the rightful successors to the Taltec Empire, their number swelled, as did their territory. Known as the Aztecs, these bands of militaristic raiders and priests would use human sacrifice as a means of coercion and terror. They employed more advanced agriculture techniques, such as chinampas, irrigation, and terrace agriculture to support their growing population. In the 1400s, the Aztec center of Tenochtitlan allied with the Texcoco and Tlacopan to form the powerful Triple Alliance, also known as the Aztec Empire. 
This empire would take over the majority of Mesoamerica, making most city-states tributaries. By the mid-1400s, the empire would fight the Flower Wars, intermittent ritual wars fought with other city-states, the most famous being Tlaxcala. This would occur until the 1500s, when the Aztec Empire would be forever changed. In South America, the Andean region, which produced the most advanced American civilizations from the ancient period, continued to thrive in the post-classical era. Most of the regions east of the Andes were primarily inhabited by seminomadic tribes, although the Amazon River Basin shows evidence of complex culture. The Andean civilizations were generally advanced and developed independently from Mesoamerican cultures. While they didn't have a writing system, they could rely on knotted strings, called kipu, to send messages or communicate over long distances. These long distances would be dominated by llamas, who were the main transporters of goods in the Americas, as they didn't have access to the horse or wheel. During the first part of this post-classical period, two Andean empires dominated the region. In northern Peru was the Huari, or Huari Empire, and to the south, also occupying parts of Bolivia, was the Tiwanaku Empire. Having roughly the same military power, they would engage in a type of Cold War, coexisting but ready for action, with minor skirmishes in proxy areas. Both empires would begin to decline around the 7 and 800s, because of changes to the environment. The 1400s saw the rise of the largest empire in all the Americas. These Quechua-speaking peoples out of the Cusco region would conquer and build upon the previous Andean culture in the area. Under the guidance of Sapa Inca, these warriors expanded into present-day Ecuador and Chile. It was soon known as the Inca Empire. These Inca were known for their use of abacuses in mathematics and their pyramid-like structures, like Machu Picchu. Their road system was also regarded as one of the best in the world at this point. An ocean away from the Inca lies Oceania. It is divided into these four subregions. The first people to migrate to Australasia and Melanesia had migrated over from Africa as far back as 50,000 years ago. Migrations from Southeast Asia are typically responsible for the populations of Polynesia and Micronesia and took place thousands of years later. They would build cities like Nan Madol and Mu'a, which would become the capital of the Chi Tonga Empire. Gaining power in 950, the Tongan Empire would reach its peak, beginning in the 1200s, and led expeditions to spread their influence all throughout the South Pacific Islands. They were adept sailors and used stick charts to help them with navigation. Polynesians were the first to discover New Zealand, Easter Island, and Hawaii. These were areas previously untouched by humans. Once settled on these different islands, the Polynesians would begin to adopt different cultures from one another. In New Zealand, this would give rise to the Maori, peoples originating from East Polynesia. Because of the island environments, new species entering the ecology was rare, and once the Polynesians arrived, it led to mass extinctions, including the moa, which was often hunted. On Easter Island, the presence of Polynesians destroyed the native ecology by hunting and the construction of their large stone statues. This resulted in their own population disappearing over time. The 29th of May, 1453. The Ottoman Empire lay siege to the city of Constantinople. The Eastern Roman Empire's defenses had always been state-of-the-art. Alas, state-of-the-art for a period long dead. Using gunpowder technologies, after a 53-day siege, the Ottomans, under 21-year-old Sultan Mehmed II, would capture Constantinople, putting an end to 1,500 years of the Roman Empire. While nomadic tribes dominated the post-classical period, that era would end, giving way to a new age of gunpowder. The Byzantines, Delhi Sultanate, and Songhai had already felt its lethal touch. 
But these were just the first of many. The modern era was here. Afro-Eurasia had become as connected as it ever was during this time, but as Europe became further cut off from the East, due to the decline of the Silk Road, they would try to find alternative ways to reach it for trade. And this would set into motion what could never be undone. And nothing would ever be the same.